It's often the case that explaining how something works removes some of its sense of magic. If I explained the plot of a murder mystery to you before you read it, you could probably still appreciate the quality of the story, but something important would have been lost from your experience. The first time experiencing a piece of media is unlike any other time, because not knowing what's coming next allows your imagination to run wild with possibilities. If this is your first time watching this video, you have no idea what I'm going to say next. I could say anything. Anyway, this poses a problem for people making reviews. If the review is favorable, the idea is to get more people to try the thing out for themselves, but in the process of explaining why the work is good, the review removes an important sense of mystery from the experience. The goal of this video is to make the argument that Magi Nation is a vastly underrated game, and ideally that means that some of you will be persuaded to go and play it. However, in order to make that argument, I have to explain much of what happens in the game and how it works, which will lessen the impact of many of its best features. This is a kind of catch-22. If I convince you to play the game, this video is a success, but I'll only have achieved that by damaging your experience of it. So I'd like to offer a compromise. If at any point in this video you feel that you've been sufficiently persuaded to go and experience the game for yourself, I'd recommend stopping the video right away and doing just that preventing me from further damaging that first-time experience. In other words, spoilers ahead. You've been warned. Magi Nation was released for the Game Boy Color in 2001. It didn't sell very well, the card game it was designed to promote went out of print, and the animated series was cancelled after a brief and mostly unsuccessful run. On the surface, the game doesn't appear to be anything spectacular. It's a turn-based monster catcher RPG that on first glance looks like nothing more than a Pokemon copy. The combat's imbalanced, there are a number of bugs, and the last quarter of the game was clearly rushed in development. Despite its flaws, Magi Nation remains one of the most memorable games I've ever played. A good chunk of that is probably just nostalgia. The games you play as a kid often make a lasting impression. But I also played plenty of more commercially successful games as a kid that never had the kind of lasting impact that Magi Nation did. Where Magi Nation really stands out is in its atmosphere. It might sound strange to talk about atmosphere for a game on a display only a couple inches wide, but whatever you want to call it, it's the overall feeling of playing the game. The feeling of being in the world and interacting with the characters. The designs are imaginative, the characters are likable, and the world has that handcrafted feel which is often too rare. Above all else, you get the sense that the developers really enjoyed making the game. There's a quirky sense of humor which makes many sections fun and engaging that would otherwise be tedious, and it's filled with obscure secrets that often seem almost like jokes on the part of the developers. A big part of the atmosphere comes from the music, which is memorable and well-crafted. Even though I've replayed Magi Nation many times over, I've never gotten sick of the music, and it's easily my favorite soundtrack from the 8-bit era. Compared to other 8-bit soundtracks, it's much more lyrical and melodic, rather than using the upbeat rhythmic style that's more common to the genre. Many of the tracks shift between major and minor keys, giving things a bittersweet flavor that contrasts with the quirky humor, but makes the darker moments in the story a lot more poignant. Although the soundtrack has an overall melancholy tone, the tracks also often closely match the specific locations or people they accompany. Ivu's music suddenly pauses in certain places, which mirrors his forgetfulness. Gia's theme takes the eerie music from the forest and puts it in a major key. And the deep sounds like bubbles rising to the surface. The best example of this match between music and narrative is in Korg and Zet's theme. Korg and Zet play the role of the archetypal bungling villain duo, in the vein of Jesse and James or Pinky and the Brain. Korg is short, fat, and dumb, whereas Zet is tall, skinny, and clever, and they're both comically inept. The music uses a minor key and a chromatically descending scale to make them seem villainous, but it also uses a lot of short notes and has a clumsy quality that highlights the comedic aspect of these characters. The melody is later joined by a countermelody below it, which matches up with the appearance of Korg and Zet. A melody up high for Zet, and a countermelody down low for Korg. The characters in Magi Nation are all pretty likable, including the protagonist. 
You play as Tony Jones, a newcomer to the town of Tavil Gorge who gets magically transported to another world. Tony has the typical cool nonchalance of a teenager, but it never comes off as cynical or aloof. More importantly, he takes most of the strange events in stride while being mildly perplexed by the quirky behavior of the people he encounters. This is important because it means Tony reacts to things in the way that the player is likely to. If Tony was equally as quirky as the other characters, it would make it much harder to relate to him, and the darker moments in the story would lose a lot of their punch. Because Tony's from a different world, he acts a little distant from the people he encounters, which makes sense on a narrative level, but it also matches the player's experience. This world and its characters are just as new to the player as they are to Tony. Despite the lightheartedness and quirky humor found throughout the game, the overall tone of the story is actually quite dark. After a few brief introductory sections, the main conflict begins with the appearance of a Shadow Geyser in Vashnarum. Orwin, the leader of Vashnarum, attempts to close it, but he fails and is fatally poisoned. A cure for Orwin's sickness can be found later on, but many players are unlikely to find it due to its location at the end of an incredibly complex and cryptic optional dungeon, which I'll get to a little later. This means that for many players, the game will end with a scene of Orwin's coffin being carried off to the sea, a surprisingly dark way to end a children's game. Orwin isn't an especially complex character, and there isn't much time to become invested in him before he gets injured. Idon is the first friend Tony makes in Vashnarum, and although he acts helpful, he turns out to be a bit of a loose cannon, at least in Orwin's eyes. It's natural for Tony and the player to want to follow Idon's guidance at the beginning of the game, but the fact that he's acting against Orwin's wishes makes you feel somewhat complicit, and maybe a bit guilty about what happens to Orwin soon after. This feeling of guilt is amplified by the revelation much later in the game that the appearance of the Shadow Geysers is a direct result of Tony's arrival in Vashnarum. Although Tony had no control over his arrival in Vashnarum, this can make the player feel somewhat responsible for Orwin's injury and all the other misfortunes in the game. If you fail to cure Orwin, this makes his death at the end of the game hit much harder, especially because you're explicitly instructed to retrieve the item that can cure him. Other places in the game throw similarly heavy punches, with many of the more heroic or humorous moments often suddenly undercut by tragedy. After making his way to the underneath, Tony is recruited, along with the incredibly handsome Gogor, for a rescue mission to save Grook from her kidnappers. This section is fairly lighthearted and does a decent job at endearing the player to the inhabitants of the underneath. After the rescue mission is completed, another Shadow Geyser appears, destroying Grook's farm and injuring her. The village elder asks Tony to take care of it, but when he learns that Tony is supposedly the great Magus Kairos, he immediately becomes anxious and tells Tony to leave the underneath as soon as possible after the geyser is stopped, which, like the situation with Orwin, plays on the player's feeling of guilt. After beating the Shadow Geyser, Tony returns to the underneath to find that the elder's anxiety was well placed. The entire town has been destroyed by Morag and his Shadow Magi. Morag turns the village elder into a worm and fights Tony, a battle which is designed to be impossible to win, humbling the player after their victory in the Shadow Geyser. After losing to Morag, Tony is captured and brought to the Cauld region, where Morag creates another Shadow Geyser. Morag leaves before the townspeople arrive on the scene, so they blame Tony for the Shadow Geyser's appearance, another example of the game using guilt against the player. The Shadow Geysers are the major dungeons in Magi Nation, somewhat similar to a classic Zelda format. Each one is thematically related to the region it's in, makes use of the key item from that region, and focuses on a different type of puzzle. The first geyser uses levers, the second uses switches, the third uses lava gates, the fourth uses whirlpools, and the fifth uses tubes. None of the puzzles are mind-blowing, but they serve their purpose well enough of mixing up the gameplay and challenging the player in a different way than in the rest of the game. The first few geysers are pretty fun, but the fourth and fifth tend to drag on a bit too long. The main problem with the geysers, in my view, is the frequency of random monster encounters. The encounters are a natural way to test the player and help them level up before the boss, and the shadow geysers would definitely be a lot more boring without any monsters, but I can't help feeling that they occur much too frequently. Many of the puzzles require the player to backtrack a considerable amount, but the random encounters can become a distraction, severely breaking up the flow of things, when the player should be focused more on solving the puzzle. This isn't a huge issue, but it becomes much worse in the shadow hold. After beating the third geyser, Tony's captured once again and imprisoned in a cell in the Shadowhold, from which he then has to escape. The most interesting thing about the Shadowhold is that it's completely optional. After activating the first couple switches, you can head left out to the balcony and jump into the water, continuing on to the next part of the story, 
If you're masochistic, however, you can head right and explore the biggest, most complicated, and most unintuitive dungeon the game has to offer. The reward at the end is the Cloud Frond, which is the item needed to heal Orwin. So besides grinding some levels out, the only reason to do this dungeon is for the narrative, which is an unusual design decision which I'm forced to respect, despite the frustration that this area causes. It can't be overstated just how confusing and annoying the Shadowhold is. The complicated system of switches and hallways is something I could never figure out on my own, and I've never been able to memorize. I still have to follow a guide to make it to the end, despite having beaten the area at least four or five times. You could easily spend days, in real-life terms, wandering through this labyrinth and end up being more confused than when you started. I don't know this for sure, but it seems like the rate for random encounters is higher here than anywhere else, and the monsters hit significantly harder than previous areas. So, as you're trying to figure out where to go, you're constantly distracted by prolonged battles, which can easily make you forget what you were just doing. In addition, there's trap chests, some of the monsters have one-hit KO moves, and most importantly, you can't save the game anywhere in the hold, which means that dying here makes you restart the entire thing over again. Everything in the Shadow Hold seems designed to be as frustrating as possible. Despite all of that, I still feel that the Shadow Hold is a tremendous asset to the game. There's no way the player will know that the Cloud Frond is here in advance, so on a blind playthrough, the only motivation you have to struggle through this frustrating experience is the promise of freeing more NPCs from their cells. Rewarding the player with a gameplay benefit like a spell or consumable could easily seem disappointing considering how much they have to put themselves through, but it makes perfect sense to reward them with something in the narrative. If you're already invested enough in the well-being of the prisoners here to continue freeing them, the best reward is something which will make the story a little happier and more satisfying. Design decisions like this might not seem like much, but getting these things right can have a big impact on the overall experience. A good example of this is the scene where Tony is captured to be taken to the Shadow Hold. After beating the third Shadow Geyser, the people of the Cauld hold a party in honor of Tony and to apologize for treating him badly before. They put on a play which depicts Tony's victory, with some poetic license, but this light-hearted scene suddenly turns dark as it's interrupted by the arrival of Morag, who immediately vaporizes Vulcan, the friend who's been helping you out in this area. The player is then given a choice, fight or run. If you run, Morag teleports over to you and takes you to the Shadowhold. The more natural choice for most people is probably to fight, but in this case, Morag kills the sisters, Karen and Eren, who stand in his way, and takes you to the Shadowhold regardless. It's worth pointing out how effectively this moment is executed. Many games try to offer the player morality choices, but these choices often fall flat for a variety of reasons. For example, many games tie these choices to gameplay mechanics that undercut the whole point of making the choice. For a lot of players, gameplay is king, so considering the morality of the situation takes a secondary role to deciding which option provides the better gameplay advantage. If the mechanically advantageous choice is also clearly the morally wrong decision, this puts players in a no-win scenario where they have to decide between sacrificing the story for the gameplay or sacrificing the gameplay for the story. Unfortunately, many developers seem to think that this kind of choice adds depth to the game, when in reality, it just makes the whole experience less enjoyable. The choice in Magi Nation has no gameplay implications whatsoever, and the end result is the same, but more importantly, there's no context for figuring out which choice is the right one. Imagining Tony as a heroic character would encourage the player to choose to fight, but the game punishes you for this by killing the sisters, again using guilt against the player. Running keeps Morag focused on you and away from the townspeople, which is safer and is something the player could figure out on their own if they think about the situation. But the key part here is the lack of any guidance from the developers. It's only because the decision doesn't have an obvious answer that the player is forced to consider the situation from within the context of the narrative, which makes the whole scene more immersive. In this case, less is more. We've gone a long way into the video without mentioning the basic combat, so I might as well do that now. The core gameplay of Magi Nation involves catching and training monsters to fight against other Magi, a similar format to Pokémon with some unique twists. Tony can have four dream creatures out at once, as well as perform magic himself, which theoretically adds depth to the combat, although in practice this often doesn't come through. The Furok you start with learns Maul very early on, which will one-shot most enemies throughout the first half of the game. A second Furok or a Tusp Wisp with Maul makes most of the game a cakewalk, at least until the last couple areas. There's a type advantage system, like in Pokémon, but the system in Magi Nation suffers from a huge flaw. In Pokémon, most trainers you encounter outside of gyms use a variety of Pokémon of different types. 
forcing you to strategize your team's setup to cover the bases. Every gym specializes in a different type, so unless you can just blast through with enough firepower, that also forces you to strategize on a longer term basis. In Magi Nation, although every region and dungeon is organized around a different elemental theme, every Magi you fight from the beginning to the end of the game, including all the bosses, uses shadow type creatures, which makes the type advantage system essentially useless outside of wild monster encounters. Beyond that, the actual setup of the type advantages is questionable. Shadow and Leaf are both weak to each other, which doesn't seem to have any purpose, and Fire is strong against Water, which is completely unintuitive. The most interesting thing about the combat is the focus system, and it does most of the work in elevating the combat beyond its obvious flaws. Essentially, the classic health and magic bars are combined into one set of energy points. Summoning monsters, casting spells, or using special attacks costs energy, which weakens Tony or his monster. Summoning a monster costs Tony the same amount of energy the monster has, so a stronger monster costs more and makes Tony more vulnerable. Using a special attack costs energy to the monster, which makes it more vulnerable in turn. The fight and defend commands don't cost any energy, but fight does a lot less damage than a special attack. This gives the player an interesting choice. Pursue the high risk, high reward strategy of using special attacks which come at the cost of health, or take the more passive approach which saves health but does less damage. This could have been implemented a bit better, however. The defend command is pretty much useless, because it wastes a turn and doesn't provide nearly enough defense to make it worthwhile. It probably would have been better to streamline things by combining it with a fight command or just getting rid of it altogether. The card game that Magi Nation was based on was originally designed to be a bridge between Pokemon and Magic the Gathering, so the fight and defend commands were probably just adopted from Magic the Gathering without too much thought about how it would work in the handheld game. There's a number of items which can be used in combat, but most of these have negligible effects besides the healing items. The Balu Leaf, Sap, and Root operate like the different levels of Potion in Pokemon games, but they're balanced a little bit better here because Tony can only carry a small number of each type. Unfortunately, this balance is undercut by a massive exploit in the shops, which baffles me that the developers didn't catch. Gems can be bought for 5 Animite, but they sell for 18 Animite, which means that at any town in the game, Tony can get 999 Animite within a minute or so. Imbalances in the combat mean that the depth of the focus system is often overshadowed by more effective strategies, but there are moments when it shines. The spell Grow costs 12 energy to cast and heals the target by 10. This can make for some interesting decisions in the early game. If a dream creature is on low health and unable to use a special attack, Tony can sacrifice some of his energy to grant the creature enough to perform one last move. But this can be risky, because the creature might be destroyed before he's able to pull the move off, leaving Tony defenseless and even more vulnerable than before. Instead of using the spell, Tony can give up on the creature and use his turn to focus, gaining free energy for himself to spend on summoning a new creature next turn. But while he's summoning the creature, he'll be left open to direct attack, which could be even riskier. These kinds of risk-reward problems are the highlight of the combat, but unfortunately they tend to appear less and less as the game progresses. Tony and his creatures can level up their stats, but spells always deal the same flat damage, so by the end of the game most of them become completely useless. Scaling the cost and damage of spells with Tony's stats would probably have added some variety and depth to the combat in later parts of the game. Of course, it'll always be the case that grinding out extra levels makes things easy for the player, but more time could have been spent balancing the combat for the later sections of the game. Overall, the combat needed some serious tweaking, but the focus system stands out as a unique spin on a classic format that does a decent job rescuing the combat from its other flaws. There's an obvious appeal to having a team of pet monsters fight for you, so it's surprising to me that this has never caught on as a genre. The tremendous success of Pokémon should have encouraged developers to try their own hand at a monster-catching game, but instead, Pokémon seems to have monopolized the field. The only example I can think of in recent years is Nino Kuni, which in my view suffered from prioritizing its visual style over the core gameplay. Roguelikes and Souls-likes often have trouble breaking the mold defined by their namesakes, so I can imagine it could put a damper on a developer's ambitions if their hard work is eventually just called a Pokemon copy in some Kotaku article, but I think this is just a failure of imagination. It wouldn't take much to set a monster-catching game apart from Pokemon, perhaps with a darker tone and an interesting spin on the mechanics. The fact that Pokemon dominates this field means that there's actually more opportunity to do something unique and unexpected, because almost nothing else has been tried. Magi Nation attempts to do that, but the results are a mixed bag, with many parts of the combat system not receiving the attention that they needed, 
Mage Eye Nation was developed essentially just to sell a card game, so there probably wasn't a huge amount of pressure to spend a lot of time refining the mechanics. On the other hand, the fact that it was made for ulterior motives probably ended up ironically giving the developers more freedom than a lot of big franchises have today. It would be difficult to dramatically change the formula for a Pokemon game because there's no need to. The formula they have works, but that also means they're less likely to try something innovative. Magi Nation isn't a huge break from the formula, but the distinctive atmosphere of the game is due at least in some part to the unique and often extremely obscure mechanics. Luck affects a wide variety of different gameplay elements, but it's never explained to you what these are. For example, there's a status effect called Hiccups, which stops your creature from attacking. Resistance to Hiccups requires high speed and low luck, but none of this is ever explained to the player. Your creature will just sometimes stop attacking because it's got the Hiccups, confusing the heck out of you. At best, it's debatable whether this is a good mechanic, but apart from gameplay considerations, it feeds into a greater theme of cryptic secrecy that pervades Magi Nation. Here are some examples. Many items and powerful creatures are hidden in secret locations, like this one which requires the player to press the A button at exactly the right place and angle against this wall. No one tells you that you can interact with this wall, there's no indication that this wall is any different from the others, and there's no previous example of interactable walls, so the only way to find this naturally is if you are pressing the A button on every part of the map for no reason. Orth and Flyer can only be encountered by walking back and forth in between the mountains on the Ardereal Overworld map, although there's no other instance of encountering monsters in the Overworld. The main menu has doorways which allow you to start a new game or continue from where you left off, but there's also a third door which is always dark. After beating the game, you can go down this secret passageway to talk to a man who will open the door as a way to start New Game Plus. By far the best example of the crypticism in Magi Nation is the Ormagon questline. Ormagon is the most powerful dream creature in the game, but the way to catch him is by far the most convoluted and obscure questline I've ever seen outside of a Souls game. In fact, when I first played Dark Souls, I was constantly reminded of Magi Nation because of the enigmatic way that both games communicate information to the player. Both games have enough trust in the player to risk hiding content in extremely obscure ways. In order to start the Ormagon quest, you have to return to the underneath to find the Ormagon Hunter directly upon waking up in Wences' house after he rescues you from Morag. This means you have to go past Gia's house without talking to her, when the most natural thing would be to tell her what just happened. Talking to Gia will trigger the next stage in the story, cutting off the Ormagon questline before it's even started. Later on, you have to pay the ferryman an extra 300 Anamite to wait for you in addition to the 300 it costs to take you to Oroth. Your goal in Oroth is to retrieve Agadon's boots, but taking the boots now will cut off the questline. Instead, you have to find some algae in the tunnels and take it back to the Ormagon Hunter all the way back in the underneath, then go all the way back again to Oroth to get the boots, then go all the way back to the room. At the statue in the training grounds, you have to start under the left eye and run around the statue five times counterclockwise while maintaining contact with the statue the whole time. I'm not making this up. You can then interact with the eye which will open up the secret compartment with the fungicide. Finally, you can return to the call to continue the main story without locking yourself out of the quest. There's no reason to think that any of this is something you should do. After beating the third Shadow Geyser, you have the opportunity to get the Cloud Frond which can cure Orwin. But if you cure Orwin at any point before the end of the Ormagon quest, the quest line is locked out. After you travel to Ascent Mar later on, you have to buy a specimen jar there, then travel back through the Oroth tunnels, take the ferry to Gia's house, travel back to the underneath, find a wall in the path to Grook's house with some fungus growing on it, and take a sample. Then you can travel all the way back to Vashnarum, talk to the boy who likes spooky plants, and give him the fungus. Finally, you can travel back to Gia's house, take the ferry back to the Oroth tunnels, continue on to Ascent Mar, and beat the fourth Shadow Geyser. After you beat the fifth Shadow Geyser, still without curing Orwin, you can return to the boy who you gave the fungus to, and use the fungicide to clear it out of his room. Then you can pick up the stool that was hollowed out by the fungicide, and go back to the underneath again, to the path leading to Grook's house where the fungus was before, and use the fungicide on the wall. Inside the secret room, you can finally use the hollow stool to summon Ormagon. It shouldn't need to be said, but the chance that any player will reach the conclusion of this quest naturally is essentially zero. Conventional wisdom would say that this makes it a bad quest, and certainly most bigger budget games made today would never include something like this. But Magi Nation, like the Souls games, understood that keeping the player in the dark about some things actually improves their experience. The discovery of a big secret isn't just exciting for the player, it also makes the world seem bigger, and it gets their imagination fired up about what other secrets lie in wait.
One example for me in particular is in the third Shadow Geyser, where there's a significantly placed door that, as far as I'm aware, can never be unlocked. I still sometimes think about this door, and if I knew anything about data mining, the first thing I'd do is check it out. Given the design philosophy of Magi Nation, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there were a substantial secret hidden behind it, and that no one's ever been able to figure it out because the way to open it is just too obscure. Easter eggs existed a long time before Magi Nation, and they still exist in plenty of games today, but for the most part, these tend to be minor things thrown in without much effort. It's much less common to hide whole quest lines or areas. It takes a lot of courage to spend time designing things that players might never see, and this is more true over time as production values for games continue to climb. Part of the reason Magi Nation felt comfortable including lots of secrets is because they probably didn't take much work, and the team was very small. Proportionally sized secrets in a modern game would probably involve much more time and many more people, and it's a lot harder to tell a hundred people that their work won't be seen rather than just one or two. Still, I admire games that keep secrets, because it indicates a kind of respect for the player. The trend in many modern games has been towards a style that keeps the player on strict rails to ensure that they receive the experience intended by the developers, but I think this is a case of mixed up priorities. A game should be fun to play first and foremost, but then players should be trusted to choose what kind of experience they want to have with it. Games are fundamentally about making choices, so game design should always ultimately reflect that. The choice at the very end of Magi Nation is by far the most interesting design decision in the whole game. Four endings are possible depending on if you cured Orwin or not, and if you decide to return to Vashna Room before heading home. The option to return to Vashna Room is also somewhat hidden. But before any of this plays out, the player has the option to choose a different, fifth ending. The final boss of the game is Agrim, an incredibly powerful magi who presents a serious challenge even to players comfortably leveled for the previous area. However, he's also completely optional. When you talk to him, he asks why Tony is standing in his way, and the player gets the choice to respond with, for justice, or to get home. If the player chooses justice, Tony channels the spirit of the great mages Kairos and the battle ensues. But if you choose to get home, Agram offers to send you back right away, which ends the game with a short scene of Tony returning to Tavil Gorge. I can't imagine that many people choose to go home without beating the final boss or resolving the situation in the Moonlands, but I find it incredibly interesting that the developers thought it was important to make this choice genuine. Most games don't allow the player to decide to run away from the entire conflict of the game, which is understandable, but it also means that the player never really makes the final decision to do the right thing. Magi Nation, on the other hand, respects the player enough to allow them to choose to take responsibility. After using guilt against the player for all the misfortune that befalls the characters in this world, Magi Nation asks you if you really want to save that world, and it gives you a genuine choice in the matter. The only other time I've seen a similar concept executed in a game is, again, an example from FromSoft, the sunrise ending of Bloodborne. But even there, it doesn't pack the same kind of punch as it does in Magi Nation. Some percentage of players must have chosen to run away from the final boss on their first playthrough and leave the Moonlands in the hands of the tyrant Agram. Having the courage to allow players to experience that is an incredibly audacious decision by the developers, and I have to respect it. I haven't said it yet, so I'll say it now. Magi Nation is a great game, and I highly recommend you go and try it out for yourself. This review might end up being overly gushy, because if it wasn't obvious, I have a lot of love for this game. As I mentioned in the beginning, that's probably in no small part due to nostalgia, but it's also because Magi Nation is just a very endearing game. Even the most frustrating or bleak parts of the game seem respectful of the player, and are often delivered with a nod and a wink from the developers, which makes you feel like you're being let in on a secret. There's nothing revolutionary about the way the game is put together, and there's plenty of places for criticism, but the world, the characters, the music, and the visual design all come together to produce a cohesive experience that's greater than the sum of its parts. Ultimately, the greatest feature of Magi Nation is its sense of mystery and magic, and it ends up being very deserving of its title, a game full of imagination.